Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to our service of worship today. Um, do any of you remember it differently? But I think last year we didn't get to have an Ash Wednesday service. I think we got snowed out. Anybody remember that? I, don't know. I, I didn't bother to look it up. Just feels like it's been a while. So, it's good to be together today. Now, uh, for today's service, you'll need the single page uh, handout. Also on the uh, music stand at the back were some copies of the Tuesday Bible study, which will start next week, Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, that will be a special Lenten uh, study about the uh, times that Jesus was put on trial. Uh, during the week of his passion. So um, you're welcome to attend that. Um, and the study will last, uh, that particular study will last just for the length of Lent. And then we'll go back to our study of Romans. So today is Ash Wednesday. The ashes uh, symbolize the biblical use of ashes by people who were in mourning to show extreme sorrow. They would tear their clothing. They would put ashes on top of their head. Um, and during a, a period of mourning, uh, go without washing and um, be obviously very sad. So the whole idea of ashes is that we have sorrow over our sin. And we express that sorrow in repentance. We receive God's forgiveness. And he turns our sorrow into joy. But today is the first step in this Lenten journey this year. We gather to make our repentance to show our sorrow over sin and to be joined together in our determination to make this a special season <coughs> to, to give extra attention and time to our relationship with God and with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So as you look at your handout, the left-hand side is the order of worship that we will use today. The right-hand column is for you to use privately. Now, in our Baptist tradition, uh, we don't require people to give up something for Lent. Other traditions, other Christian churches have that as a requirement or as a very strong suggestion. But as I explain on the right hand side here, this is purely a voluntary act. It is purely between you and God. And it, I only have some instructions here to help guide you in deciding what you might give up for Lent. And then I take it just a little step further than the traditional and to say, you know, after you've given it up for 40 days, have you found you can live without it? Maybe just as well give it up permanently then and, and give that to the Lord. Um, so this is only to uh, guide and inspire your thinking. It's entirely voluntary, entirely between you and the Lord. And uh, so no one's going to ask you about that. Uh, that is strictly on your own. Okay, so we're going to begin uh, this afternoon with a call to worship, which is printed on your order of worship. It's derived from the book of Job, chapter 42, and uh, we'll read it responsively. So leader and people and then all. Everything that's in capital letters, I'd like you to say together. Then Job replied to the Lord. I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You asked, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? 
it is I. I spoke about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will see. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I have only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come here today, and we're not going to rend our clothing, we're not going to sit in ashes and pile them on our heads, but in our way, we want to say to you, and demonstrate to you that our sorrow over sin is genuine. It is personal. We recognize that we have offended you. Even as we have brought offense to ourselves, to our family name, Lord, to others. And our desire in this Lenten season, and specifically today, is to make it right, to repent, to receive your forgiveness, to have our sorrows turned to joy. And we're looking ahead, Father, we're thinking about the sufferings of Jesus and how we will remember them in these days of Lent. We're thinking about his death and then beyond that, his resurrection to eternal life. And we want to be a part of it, Lord. We want to feel those feelings we want to have that spirit. And we do it through you. We receive it from you. So let these moments of worship today be pleasing in your sight. With your spirit's help, we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 So the first part of repentance, the first movement that is pictured in the act of repentance is turning away from sin. It's turning our focus away from self, away from sin, away from the things that lead us away from God. Would you turn in your pew Bible to Ezekiel 18, verses 1 to 4, and then 30 to 32. So we'll start out on page 1293, and then go to 1294. And follow along, please, as I read. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. For all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. Now verse 30 on page 1295. Therefore, I will judge each of you 
O people of Israel, according to your actions, says the Sovereign Lord, repent and turn away from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the Sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. Here we see God calling us to understand that the responsibility for our sin is ours alone. He's warning us that there is a day of judgment. It is coming. We will stand before our Creator and we will give account first and foremost of what we have done with His Son, Jesus Christ. If we have believed followed and then we will give an account of what we have done with the life he has given us in this world did we live for him in a godly way or did we live for self in an ungodly way let's take a moment then each of us in silent prayer for the confession of our own sins. Our Father, we ask you to forgive us for the sins we have committed, the wrong we have done, the words we have spoken in anger, the grudges we have held, the prejudice we have kept. For the ways may be large, may be small, where we have cheated or lied. The little sins of the tongue that are like foxes in the vineyard destroying the grapes. These are things we've chosen to do. We know better. But we don't always do better. Let us be humbled, Father, by the weight of that sin, even as you relieve us of it. Let us not 
hold ourselves as bad creatures. Let us know we serve a very good God. Forgive us also our sins of omission where we saw the good that we needed to do and we chose not to do it. Where we had an opportunity to speak a word of encouragement or witness and we kept silent. Where we had an, an opportunity to give and we kept it for ourselves. When we were called to service or worship or fellowship and we decided just to stay home. Forgive us for not passing along good news and, and being encouragers as you want us to be. You have said these things are bad because we knew we should do them and we did not. And they are no less serious in your eyes. So we beg your forgiveness. And then, Father, your word even provides forgiveness for sins we have committed in ignorance. Things that we said or did or did not say or did not know, do but didn't know at the time. You even forgive us those things. We didn't intend to defy you. We didn't intend to hurt anyone. And, and yet somehow it happened. Your forgiveness of us is so complete that it erases all of those kinds of sins. Your forgiveness is so lasting and pure. It cleanses us of all ungodliness. We thank you for that relief. Now, Father, we pray for your church, not just the one we're standing in, but your church across the nation, across the world, We pray, Lord, that you will forgive us when we have watered down your word, when we have weakened the just requirements of your law, when we have made it too easy, when we have not followed you. when we have not provided an alternative, a, a voice that is contrary when things are said or done that are evil, untrue, unholy. And Lord, you never call us to be belligerent. You never call us to be argumentative. You call us to be Gentle, but firm. Not aggressive, but assertive. Forgive us when we are neither. And Father, we pray for our nation. I don't know if things are really worse or we just hear about it so much more often and it seems worse. But there are bad things happening. There always have been. There are bad people. There always have been. But we're not going to take their word for it. We're not going to take their existence as a sign that you approve. 
But instead, Lord God, we pray for forgiveness and we pray for an influence that happens on an individual level in a community and in a country. Father, we call upon our leaders to be reasonable, rational, fair-minded people. And we recognize that as citizens of this country, we respect each other. But for us as citizens of your heavenly kingdom, we don't have to accept everything. We need wisdom. We need to trust you. And we need firmness in our spine, even as we ask for softness in our heart. Having confessed all these things, Lord God, for ourselves, for our community, nation, church, we breathe in your forgiveness. We inhale your spirit and exhale every other spirit. Cast aside our doubts. Cast aside every evil influence. Let us serve you purely, even though we can't serve you perfectly. For there is more forgiveness for every word of repentance. We are very grateful for that and pray now these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have accomplished the first movement, which is to turn away from sin. <coughs> now, the second movement in repentance is to turn toward God. We don't seek a neutral position. We don't seek the middle ground between these extremes. We want to be oriented toward God. So I'm going to ask you to take your songbook, please. And turn to the responsive reading, number 523. It is entitled, Forgiveness. You'll be reading the parts in the bold face print. From Isaiah chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll take a moment to lead you in prayer just briefly. Here, Lord God, we are coming to you to pray for reconciliation. We have turned from our sin. We have forsaken it. We have asked you to forgive us and we have received your forgiveness. Now, we turn to you to be reconciled to you. There would be very little point in purifying us from sin. 
if we didn't complete the work of salvation. And that is to be reconciled with you. That's possible through your son Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Father, we urgently need you. And we want to be reconciled to you. And Father, your word makes it clear to us that there, there is no reconciliation with you unless we are reconciled to one another. Jesus went so far as to say, if you're bringing a gift and there's an offense between you and a brother or sister, set the gift down. Interrupt the worship. Go and be reconciled to that offended or offending brother or sister. And then go worship. And in that teaching, forever enshrining the importance of being together. We need each other so much. These relationships in family and in church are not optional. They're a necessity. Let us be reconciled to one another. Let us do the hard work of, of daily reconciling with our loved ones at home, in our extended families, in our church family. What would be the point, Lord, of this season of this sacrifice that Jesus made for us if it didn't bring us together. If it didn't restore those very pleasant bonds of fellowship. And even now as we are here praying, we hear downstairs the voices of those serving and they are glad voices. They are happy to be together and to be joining in service. We know that feeling. We have had that joy and we would renew it again and again every time we gather. Let us be reconciled to our fellow citizens. Father, let us talk to each other, not about or above or around each other. Let us not allow the temporary or the trivial to put a block between us. Let us not allow a love of the world to stand between us and you. But instead, as scripture commands, be ye reconciled one to another. Through the great reconciler, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we make this prayer. Amen. I want to give you assurance that you are pardoned, that you are forgiven. This is in your program. Then if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to the Lord. 
Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. One of the symbols of ashes on this day is the destruction of sin. It's been reduced to ash. In other traditions, ashes are imposed on the forehead of the worshiper. And that's a perfectly good and biblical way of observing this day. However, it's become customary in our church to take ashes and impose them on this board. And you can see some of the lighter gray crosses are of ash alone. But lately we've taken to painting these crosses, these black crosses, in a black paint with ash incorporated. And leaving these, uh, these ashes on this board in the sign of the cross is our way of saying we're forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. And as a sign of gratitude and as a sign of our own wholeness and forgiveness, we paint a cross on this board. I'm going to ask you to come in, in a few minutes if you are willing. Take the brush and being careful not to get any of it on yourself. Paint a cross anywhere on this board that you like. Make it as big as you like. Cover over other crosses. What matters here is the demonstration of your forgiveness and nothing else. May you come. Please be careful to not trip over the mat.
as we conclude, I'd like to read to you from Isaiah 61. And I'd like you, if you would please, to just sit there and receive these words. You can close your eyes, you can do whatever you want, but really hear them and feel the love that God is expressing in these words. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. <clears throat> Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding, or a bride with her jewels. The Sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring, with plants springing up everywhere. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you stand, please? Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen.